Hi, everyone. Hi, Helen. Other members? On the steps, on the steps, okay. Where's Jen? Jen. Should I, should I start or wait for the other members? Okay, I'll start, okay. Hi everyone, what? Okay. Hi everyone, sorry we're a few minutes late. Good afternoon, happy Wednesday. On today's stated agenda, the council will vote on the following article 11 property tax exemptions approved by the committee on finance. 340 South Third Street in Council Member Reynoso's district. It's a 40 year property tax exemption uh, to preserve affordable housing. Harlem House in Council Member Bill Perkins' district. Another 40 year property tax exemption to preserve affordable housing. In Olinville Manor in Council Member Richie Torres' district, a 32 year property tax exemption to preserve affordable housing. The council will vote on the following land use items a 306 seat universal pre K center in Council Member Francisco Moya's district and the East New York North NCP will facilitate the development of 41 units of affordable housing in Council Member Rafael Espinal's district and the following applications are in my council district. 201 to 207 7th Avenue will, develop, will facilitate the development of a new nine story mixed use residential building with 26 uh, affordable home ownership units and ground floor retail space. I have worked on this for like over a decade, long before I was elected to the council, so it's a small project, but I'm glad it's happening today. 515 West 18th Street uh, garage special permit uh, for uh, some parking spaces. Um, moving on, the council will vote on the following pieces of legislation. First, uh, Councilmember Margaret Chin has put forward introduction 30A, which would significantly strengthen the ability of the Department of Housing Preservation and Development to recover relocation expenses where a building owner's negligence or failure to maintain. Come on in, Margaret. I'll repeat that. Councilmember Chin has put forward introduction 30A, which it would significantly strengthen the ability of HPD to recover relocation expenses where a building's owner's negligence or failure to maintain a property results in a vacate order and tenant displacement. And I want to invite Councilmember Chin to come up and speak on this bill. Thank you, Speaker. I am thrilled that our council will be voting today on intro 30A, my bill to force landlords to pay for temporary housing for tenants displaced after a vacate order. We are talking about the worst of the worst landlords in New York City who have routinely failed to maintain their buildings, creating seriously unstable condition that require a vacate order. As a result, tenants have to vacate their home for their safety, sometimes in the middle of the night. As of this month, HPD site 876 household in emergency shelter as a result of a vacate order. We can't allow these landlords to take a back seat to the suffering and trauma they have caused tenants. Intro 38 will put these landlords on the hook by requiring HPD to create a system of repayment for any relocation expense the city accrued. This will serve as a new tool to incentivize landlords to make the necessary repairs to lift the vacate order and bring tenants back home sooner. I want to thank Speaker Johnson, our housing chair, Carnegie, and all my fellow co-sponsors for their support on this bill. No landlord should get away with forcing innocent tenants to pay the price of their own negligence. And I look forward to passing this bill. Thank you. Congratulations, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, we'll also be voting on a set uh, of important bills and a resolution related to how some of our federal benefits are administered. And these bills show our commitment to treating people with respect and dignity as they make use of our public benefit system. Unfortunately, this vote comes at the same time uh, as yet another attack from the Trump administration against our nation's social safety net, an attack directly on immigrants and low-income individuals. 
the new public charge rule put forward by the Trump administration this, piece, this week is hateful and inhumane. It undermines what we stand for as a city and what we should stand for, stand for as a nation. And although, as of now, it looks like the White House is moving forward with this rule, despite how it will harm public health, I want the people of New York City and the members of this body to know that we will continue to fight uh, and stand with immigrant communities and fight back against this. Uh, and hopefully this get challenged uh, in the courts. The bills and resolutions that we'll be voting on were introduced after an incredibly disturbing video of one woman's experience at the Human Resource Administration building in Borham Hill came to light last December. Uh, it's Jasmine Headley, as you all know. These bills cannot change what happened to Ms. Headley or how she and her son were treated, but we're aiming to improve our public benefit system to better serve all New Yorkers. The first bill is Introduction 1349 from Councilmember Danny Drum, and it will require that the NYPD implement child-sensitive arrest policies that can help minimize trauma and long-term consequences for kids whose caregivers are being arrested Clearly, officers should not be ripping a baby out of their mother's arms, like we saw on that video. And this bill will require the police department to retrain its officers on how to handle situations like Jasmine Headley's so that it never happens again. And I want to, I want to uh, ask Danny Drum to come up and speak on this. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Speaker and Public Safety Chair Donovan Richards, for your commitment to reviewing how city agencies, including HRA and NYPD, interact with individuals throughout the city. Last year's unfortunate incident involving Jasmine Headley highlighted the need for law enforcement to proceed with due sensitivity. When arrest of parents and caretakers are inevitable, the police should be following proper procedures that consider the welfare of, ch of the children involved. Intro 1349A does this by requiring the creation of guidance aimed at reducing the trauma of arrest on both parents and their children. Such guidance will minimize the more traumatizing aspects of parental arrest and provide such parents the opportunity to ensure that their children are in safe hands. Notably, the NYPD will be required to work with partner organizations to offer assistance to arrested parents. Together with my council colleagues and the advocates, including Tanya Kruppat of the Osborne Association, I look forward to continuing to examine ways in which we can mitigate the harmful collateral impacts of the criminal justice system. Thank you. Uh, in this package of bills specific to uh, the Human Resource Administration, we first have introduction 1382A from Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, which would require HRA to perform an audit of its operations, policies, and procedures at job centers and SNAP centers with the goal of increasing operational efficiency. And I would invite Helen to come and speak on her important bill. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. My bill and the others passing today follow the unacceptable treatment of Jasmine Headley, the forcible taking of her son, her arrest, and her detention. After she had gone to a city-run HRA center in need of assistance because her benefits were inexplicably cut off. Let's be clear, the way that we treat our most vulnerable residents is a direct reflection of who we are as a city. Anyone who seeks assistance should be able to expect respectful and efficient service. And tragically, this is not the case. Over the years, we have heard many accounts of unacceptable treatment of New Yorkers at city-run public assistance and SNAP centers. What happened to Jasmine Headley is a stark reminder of the indignities and injustices that low-income residents are forced to endure. Under the leadership of Speaker Johnson, the council will vote on my legislation mandating a top-to-bottom review of client treatment at the city's HRA centers. Information secured through my bill will be used to ensure that what happened to Jasmine Headley never takes place again, and that DSS and HRA make all the necessary changes to ensure appropriate service for every New Yorker who visits one of our centers. Specifically, my legislation mandates a full audit, examining waiting times for clients, the number of employees at each of the centers, 
requests for assistance that have been rejected and other key factors. And the audit will not be carried out in a vacuum. Five advocacy organizations will consult, will review and comment on all of the agency findings. The agency must address all outstanding issues. By next March, the audit findings after advocate review must be provided to the city council and the general public. Correspond correspondingly, DSS and HRA must also report on how they plan to address all of the issues that had been identified. It's imperative that we get to the bottom of the institutional failures that led to HRA's terrible treatment of Jasmine Headley. Ms. Headley and too many other New Yorkers are essentially being punished for their need to seek assistance as if poverty were a crime. As a society, that is our failure, not theirs. Uh, next is related to that bill is uh, introduction 1350A from Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, which would require HRA to develop and implement a plan to improve client experiences based on the audit required by Councilmember Rosenthal's bill. HRA would be required to implement that plan by January 1st, 2021. Next is my bill, introduction 1332A, which would codify the Office of Constituent Services within the Department of Social Services. This office would be responsible for receiving and addressing comments, questions, and complaints in a timely manner. The office would also develop strategies and recommendations regarding communication with clients and benefit recipients. And people receiving public benefits should be able to navigate the system in a way that doesn't place an undue burden on them. And the Office of Constituent Services will help to ensure that for, that for New Yorkers who turn to HRA. Next is introduction 1389A, sponsored by public advocate Jumani Williams. This bill would require HRA to report on instances in which public assistance was terminated or denied. These reports would provide valuable insight into the various hurdles public assistance recipients face when applying for or maintaining their benefits. And I would invite the public advocate to come speak on his bill. I just want to say thank you to the speaker and thank you to uh, General Welfare Committee Chair Levin and all the council members who are passing this piece of legislation today and actually the entire uh, package that will be passed today. Uh, Jasmine's arrest was seen by the whole city as an example of government at its worst. Uh, with these reforms, we're attempting to show government at its best, and I hope people uh, see that, improving the experiences of our most vulnerable constituents seeking public assistance. As I mentioned, intro 1389 would specifically address this matter as it seeks to report termination of denial of public assistance. Specifically, the Department of Social Security Human Resource Administration will be required to be post on its website and submit to the council and the public advocate a quarterly report of the instances where a recipient's public assistance is determinated. A uh, wrongful termination of denial or denial of public assistance can have a very harmful effect on families and lead to extremely disdainful treatment at public benefits offices. As the majority leader pointed out earlier, uh, the press conference is probably the same here. This is not a, a one-off event. This is something that people experience on a regular basis. Addressing wrongful termination or denial of public services or even knowing the reasons behind why the services are terminated or denied is essential to ensuring that many New Yorkers are able to feed their families and receive health care and make ends meet. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, Jasmine Headley herself uh, for the leadership that she has provided and making sure this issue does not go away. And again, uh, very often, uh, you know, that day on December 18th, uh, 2018, uh, we did see the worst of bureaucracy and government. And I'm proud to work with this body here uh, to show the best of it as we correct this. Thank you. Thanks, Germani. Uh, next is a bill sponsored by uh, Councilmember Steve Levin, who chairs the Committee on General Welfare. As chair, he did a lot of work on these bills and has done a great job moving them forward. And I really want to thank him for his really incredible leadership on this package of bills. His bill, Introduction 1359A, would require HRA to report on instances in which public assistance was terminated and subsequently reopened within three months. This data will help us identify how often technical glitches within the state welfare management system cause benefits to be wrongfully terminated. 
Introduction 1333A from Council Member Adrian Adams, who's here, would require HRA to provide reporting on enforcement activity within job and SNAP centers, including on arrests, summonses, removals, escorts, and incidents with use of force. And I want to invite Adrian to come speak on her important bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good afternoon. Over the past year, we have received many accounts of poor treatment of people visiting HRA centers in need of assistance. We have to take steps to ensure that this doesn't happen to anyone ever again. Vulnerable New Yorkers that go to HRA offices for help should not have to second guess how they will be treated. I am proud to join my colleagues in this package of legislation to improve treatment of clients and the quality of service at HRA centers. It is time that we address the flaws in our social services system. And I want to stand here and publicly thank Jasmine Headley for being the example of the torture and the horror that should have never taken place in December. My bill, intro 1333, would require the Department of Social Services, Human Resources Administration, to report on use of force incidents that occur in HRA centers. This bill is a necessary step to improve accountability and transparency. We must ensure that this agency or improves their policies and protocols to prevent future trauma from any family in need. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, next is introduction 1403A, sponsored by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, which would require HRA to report annually on the number of comments, questions, and complaints made by clients on whether inquiries have been resolved and on the most frequent category of inquiries. Next are three bills by Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel. Introduction 1335A would establish a pilot program for having social work services available at HRA job centers to interact with clients. This bill would require th uh, the provision of such services at every job center by January of 2021. And introduction 1336A would require HRA to conduct trainings on de-escalating conflict and trauma-informed care for all employees who work at job centers or SNAP centers, including contracted security staff. And introduction 1337A would require HRA to provide a designated space for children in every job and SNAP center. These spaces would include comfortable seating and age-appropriate education materials. And I want to thank Councilmember Amprey Samuel for these really important bills as part of this package. Uh, next is introduction 1347A, sponsored by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and it will require HRA to maintain systems that allow clients to reschedule appointments over the phone, and also from the Majority Leader is Resolution 721. This resolution calls on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would provide benefit recipients with a grace period before terminating their public assistance or SNAP benefits due to a change in income or employment status. This change would likely be significant for many recipients as it would give them time to contest the termination of benefits or prepare for the termination and I would invite the majority leader to come forward and speak on her bill and resolution. I want to thank Speaker Corey Johnson and Council Member Steve Levin and all of my colleagues. Um, this is truly important legislation. Um, oftentimes when something happens there is such a, a viral impact to it it's on social media, everyone's talking about it, and then it goes away. And so I really applaud this council for not letting such a critical issue just quote unquote go away. And over the course of months, we have been preparing, we have been talking, we have been going back and forth with how can we truly stop something so horrific from happening again. Jasmine Headley's situation um, is certainly one that is uh, not uncommon in the city of New York, what is uncommon is that it was captured in the way that it was captured. And if not for that video, perhaps no one would have even believed that something so tragic could happen to someone. So I really want to applaud all of my colleagues for this particular piece of legislation. But just on another note, um, as a mother, as a single parenting, co-parenting mother, I am really passionate about these issues because my son is also two years old, uh, about the same age as Jasmine Headley's son. And so to see that, I certainly saw myself in that same position and in those same shoes. And for me, just yesterday, my son and I uh, 
I selected which daycare that he would go to. And I selected the daycare because it was near the Franklin Avenue train station. So it was the two, three, four, and five. That meant I could get to work here from the two, three, four, and five. They said I have a grace period to get there until 9.30, whereas the other daycare said I had to be there at 8 a.m. Not happening with this job. The other daycare said that you have to be here at 8 a.m. and you have to make breakfast and lunch for your son and provide a snack. The other daycare provides the breakfast, lunch, and the snack, so I don't have to prepare those things. These are all the things that goes into someone's thought process. Transportation, how much does it cost? How am I gonna get there? What's the prep time? To interrupt someone from saying, your ability to go to this daycare center is no longer possible. You'll have to choose another daycare tomorrow that does accept um, your payment or your voucher. These sorts of things should not happen in the city of New York. And so this piece, this resolution that um, we are introducing today, I'm hoping that my colleagues on the state level will also support this because no one should be without benefits because they've either uh, gotten a job or because they've been terminated from a job, this is certainly what I want to see happen. And just as I stated earlier, you know, for black women um, in the city of New York, this is really critical legislation because anyone looking at that knows that everyone at that HRA office made a decision that this particular black woman with a child didn't count, didn't matter, was not worthy of the respect and the dignity of anyone coming into their offices. And I'll just simply close uh, with words from Malcolm X that the most disrespected woman in America is the black woman. The most unprotected woman in America is the black woman. And the most neglected woman in America is the black woman. And I'm proud of my colleagues today that we are working hard to change that narrative and to change that reality in the city of New York. And I can't thank Speaker Coria Johnson enough for making sure that the change to this came with legislation and that we have the ability to continue to push these issues into the forefront. Thank you. Thanks, and finally, uh, the council will vote on resolution 978 from Councilmember Farrah Lewis, which calls upon Congress to pass and the president to sign the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2019, VAWA, lapsed earlier this year after it was not extended by Congress and the United States Senate has yet to consider the law despite the law passing the House of Representatives with strong bipartisan support. This will also be the first item, which is great, put forward by Councilmember Lewis and we'll be voting, that we're voting on since she was sworn in. So I wanna congratulate her, I'm proud of her. This is such an important resolution and I'm glad that we are doing this today and that she has been a leader on this and so many issues in her short time here in the council. So I invite Councilmember Lewis to come up and speak on this important resolution that she's passing. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I am asking my colleagues to pass Resolution 978, which calls on Congress and the President to, author, to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, this piece of legislation is very important to me because I am a survivor of domestic abuse. And as a survivor, it's very important to have resources and a place to go for refuge, like the Family Justice Center. So with the federal government not reauthorizing this particular act, it puts women like myself, individuals that are survivors in a very detrimental place. So today I'm asking my colleagues to support this piece of legislation because violent crimes in New York City have fallen in the past 10 years, but domestic violence incidents have increased. And CompStat has shown that NYPD had to respond to over 250,000 domestic uh, incident reports in just 2018 alone, which means that this situation is still happening. People are still in detrimental situations and we need the federal government to respond to this and it's really disgruntling and upsetting to know that we have to over and over again ask the federal government to reauthorize this particular act so i'm asking my colleagues for their support today and most importantly i would just like to thank uh speaker johnson for his leadership and his support with this particular bill and i hope my colleagues will jump on and support this thank you congratulations Sarah. That is it for today's agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes and I'm happy to take on topic questions first. Anything on, on these bills that we're voting on today? Going once. Okay, off topic. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs> yes.
Sure. Robert, uh, what you can tell us about that, like the similarities between the I'm um, introducing a bill today uh, with Councilmember Joni um, on really trying to legalize hostel again. I think we want to create more opportunity for low cost um, housing for travelers, especially uh, young people. Uh, and also because there's so many the Airbnb that's happening in the city, we're losing a lot of affordable housing. And so we think that it's really important to bring back hostels so that we could provide affordable accommodation uh, for people who don't have a lot of money and especially young people and seniors who love to travel. And a lot of this is happening all over the world. And we think that in New York City, we should start doing that again. Thanks, Margaret. I mean, I, I haven't had a chance to look at the bill itself. A lot of bills are getting introduced, but um, I look forward to working with Councilmember Chin and Joe and I, and it will go through the legislative process. Yes, Clay. Oh, go ahead, Henry. Go ahead. I think that's why we're going to push for a hearing so that we could explore all this issue. But the intent is really to create affordable accommodation and also to really challenge all the Airbnb that's happening in the city that's taking away affordable housing. Well, we were, I was not involved. And I think this council, we were not involved in our lawyer. Clayton. Yeah, going back to the Council Report 2340, sure. I just wanted to say that our state of concern that uh, the tax restriction proposed, or planned tax restriction proposed, turns that increase into parking lot. What basis in that is to have the tax restriction? Well, I want to be clear that I support the pilot program to get uh, bus riders moving across 14th Street. And uh, I think we need to let it move forward. So I support that. I'm, I'm going to get to it, Clayton. I'll get to it. Um, the DOT agreed to my request to hire a third party firm that would help us monitor this pilot and collect and analyze data around 14th Street and the surrounding uh, side streets. And I think that th this, this will provide concrete data in real time on what's working and what needs to be adjusted during the pilot. I also want to make sure that traffic agents are in the community strictly enforcing all traffic laws to protect pedestrians and cyclists and ensure that this goes as smoothly as possible. And when the pilot is over, we'll know what worked and what didn't work. I think we need to use this as an opportunity to come up with a permanent solution to improve the way people and especially bus riders get across 14th Street. And again, as I've said all along with the master plan, Plan, with the state of the city address, all of this, we have to prioritize pedestrians, cyclists, and mass transit users in New York City. So, I mean, I, I, su I'm, I support the pilot. I want it to move forward. I think there are some local concerns, and I think that I was inartful and unclear on Brian Lair uh, uh, earlier this week when I spoke about those concerns without first talking about my support of the proposal, the third party uh, analyzer that's going to be looking at this, the traffic enforcement agents. I didn't discuss that on Brian Lair. I should have. Instead, I just flagged the concerns. It was a little sloppy. Uh, it was a little clumsy. It wasn't clear. And so that's why yesterday when I was on Good Day New York, I tried to be a little more clear. And that's why I'm trying to give this full answer to you about my entire higher thinking on all of this. Um, I, I would just say that, you know, uh, I live on 15th Street between uh, 7th and 8th Avenues. Um, and um, 
you know, there have been times when that, that block uh, is very, very congested. But I do think we have to do this in an evidence-based way, and I think that goes to the point of your question. And that is why it's really important for us to actually have real-time data that, that goes through that we can see on a weekly basis to understand how traffic is moving and to readjust traffic enforcement agents, redeploy people around, and continue to make sure that buses get across 14th Street because one of the big issues here is that M14A has seen a precipitous drop off of riders because it's faster to walk across town than it is to take the bus some days. So hopefully that provides a little more clarity and my full thinking on the entire issue. I think he may have lost his mind to say something like that, and he should apologize. I condemn that comparison in the strongest terms. It is ridiculous and offensive, and you know it, it, people should not be invoking the KKK when we're talking about 14th Street in Manhattan. It's insane. Any other questions? Yes, Rich. Mm -hmm. I honestly haven't had a chance to read the full report itself. I read some of the press coverage that surrounded it. Um, and uh, if I am remembering it correctly, it's not the freshest thing on my mind, but if I remember it correctly, I believe it talked about the various factors uh, across the city that are leading to this high vacancy retail crisis that we're seeing in certain neighborhoods. And I think some of the things that were mentioned in that report are uh, some regulatory uh, hurdles and issues that take place this unfair property tax system where property taxes get passed on to small business owners that are renting space, uh, sky high rents in certain neighborhoods, and a variety of other things that are causing this. I think one of the challenges here is that I'm not sure there's a singular silver bullet that solves all of this. It is a combination of all these things. I look forward to the Property Tax Commission releasing the results of its report that it's been working on for more than a year now. And I hope that in that report they address small businesses as part of it, not just residential businesses, uh, but small businesses, I mean, not just residential units, but small businesses as well. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the struggles we've had is when you have to craft a policy, the, the way you treat um, retail in Soho may not be the same way you treat retail in Brownsville. And so crafting a policy and a law that covers all of these dynamic different neighborhoods is a challenge. We are looking at all of this. Uh, it's why we passed the bills we passed at the last stated meeting on having a vac vacancy tracker and also a tracker on rents, how they've gone up, how they've gone down in certain businesses. And we think that once we have this information, we'll be able to make informed, uh, more informed policy decisions and, and decisions on legislation moving forward. So that's not a talking point answer that I just gave you, I'm sorry. But I think it's a complicated issue and it's also one of, I think, the top five issues that I hear about when I go across the city from New Yorkers who are upset about vacant storefronts. We're trying to address it. We can't do it all uh, on our own as a council. We need help from the administration and the state legislature could play a role here with a potential vacancy tax or vacancy sur surcharge. They're the ones that have the authority to do that. And we're looking at all of those things currently. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I would say that for a very long time, Bleecker Street in, in my district was looked at as like Madison Avenue in the village, and now it's uh, many of it's vacant and, and there are blighted storefronts. You could say the same thing about, uh, I just know, I mean, I, where I live, 8th Avenue between 14th Street and 23rd Street, tons of vacant storefronts. 7th Avenue between 14th Street and 23rd Street, 14th Street from Union Square all the way over to 8th Avenue, certain stretches of the village. That's just in my district. If you go over to the East Village, it's the same thing. Parts of Murray Hill, it's the same thing. Parts of the Upper West Side, it's the same thing. And it's just not in Manhattan. Talk about. Talk